Uh, let's, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for your son. More than anything, we thank you for your son and that you chose to share him with us, that you chose to give him into us, that we could draw from his mind, from his heart, from his heartbeat, from the things that are important to him, and that we can cry, Abba, Father, by him in us, to you, Father, that you would be glorified. And thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who is so faithful, so honorable to lift up, not himself, to speak of, not himself, but of your Son, and to reveal him in us. And so, Father, I just ask you in each and every class and each and every time that it not be a class, that it not be a church service, but it be our hearts gathering unto him and unto you by him, Father, and unto him by the Spirit of God. So we, we ask it, we desire it, we desire it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm, not, I'm really not sure how much and where I'm all going to go tonight. Uh, again, not feeling the greatest, but um, I want to introduce uh, not just a new t-shirt to you but to introduce a new chart, but not just a tonight chart, but using one particular subject, um, I want to uh, show you a format of a chart that I believe the Lord gave me that I think can help us down the road a little, not, not even way down the road. But as we get rolling with it, I think it'll help us to gather up the things and the thoughts that the Lord has, has to say. Mainly what we're focusing on is the one below with the with the white all of this down here you you've had the the corridor introduced so we're going to use that later on it's going to be important to match these things but i'm not going to explain that all right now but for the f for the first part i want you to just see that the shape here is a circle with these little bars coming out it's going out to words, but bef the words are interchangeable. These are magnets, magnetic things. So these words and the subject in the middle can be changed. This, the, the theme will always be in the center. And then we will have these words that are attached to that particular theme or word uh, that's in the center. And, um, and I don't know if you noticed, but if we took the words off of here, and we erase the theme, it just kind of looks a little bit like a coronavirus. <laughs> and I thought that would just really thrill you. Uh, so I'm just going to read, uh, read some of this as we look at it. What the chart looks like, the chart may look like the coronavirus. There will be a central word placed in the middle, and that will probably change from week to week. The new chart, uh, each one of them will show corresponding words, as you can see around this, corresponding words that are used around the central word. And uh, all around this circle will be posts, the posts there, uh, that have different words at the end of each post. Okay, and um, so... Um, let me just, so, so let's address the, the words that are on the outside. Uh, the purpose for the added words. I've stated in the past that Paul and Peter are different from one another. Their emphasis has differences. Their word definitions are different. Their ways of approach are different. And it becomes more complicated when we realize that most of us have been thoroughly taught by Paul. Therefore, it behooves us to take 
steps that will help us in two ways. Okay, so the steps are uh, by seeing these, we're going to be continually faced with Peter's definitions of his of these words, and by doing that, it's going to keep us from applying old definitions to faith and believing and hope and and revealed and appearing and sufferings and glory. Um, it's going to it's going to keep by doing this chart this way. It's going to keep us tied to Peter's definitions instead of reverting back to Paul constantly, which we're so familiar with that we easily revert back to that. Okay. And the second thing, I said it behooves us to take steps that will help us in two ways. The second thing is to give us corresponding words that will prove Peter's meanings. And that's, that's what we want to do. We want to prove those meanings. Anybody can go to a book of the Bible and say, well, this means that, and this means that, and this means that. And I think in a situation like this with, with Peter, um, uh, since it's a, a book that we don't normally deal with so much, uh, it's easy, it would be easy for someone, me, anybody, to just say, oh, well, this means that, and this means that, and this means that, and to tie it all together with what they, what they think. This chart, and as we follow through with this chart, is going to prove that these are the meanings of the words that he's using. Okay, and so uh, there was a time not that long ago that I spoke uh, concerning, um, it was at the end of one of our, our times together, and I spoke of... Um, uh, like a, a family of words that they that the that the writings of Paul and his words are like a family that gather together and they support one another. I, I'm sure some of you remember me saying that, and and that was at the very end of a class. And I thought when I left, I thought that must sound crazy, you know, in a certain sense, because um, it could they could be. Um, words that support you know these meanings but a family of words but i i see it that way i've seen it that way in in my studies in in first peter to see that they become a family that support one another in their meaning and that you don't you don't just isolate one word and find the definition and you stay with that what you do is you find a word, and then you find the family of words around it that are always around that word in, in 1 Peter. And from there, you can clearly draw the definition. So I probably said all that here. But um, those words will be words that correspond to the central word, which is what I said before. All these circular around it will correspond to whatever the cent central word or thought is. Um, we will be using corresponding words to help give definition to the individual word placed in the circle, okay? So all of these guys are going to be a family that supports the meaning of what's in that circle. Uh, in many cases, they will all together disprove the old definition, meaning, well, let me go ahead and finish reading. Uh, in many cases, they will all together disprove the old definition of the central word as applied to Paul's definitions. This is critical, for if we cannot move away from Paul's definitions to Peter, we will never understand this epistle. And that's just a fact. All right, so basically, um, we're going to be, uh, uh, we'll probably deal with this this subject next week. We did deal with it in the past, but I want to deal with it in the context of this chart that the Lord gave me, and it'll help not just focus on one word and then next class one word and next class one word. It will help us to see how these words are supporting each word as we go forward so that they don't stand alone and by themselves. So we'll have eventually another word in here, and we'll have other 
words that that will usually surround that word in First Peter uh, to help define the true meaning of what that's all about. All right, so um, let me uh, let me find what I'm trying to find. Okay, so that was that's important. We're not going to deal with that tonight, but that's this is going to be a real important upgrade, if you will, of, uh, of grasping First Peter. And I thank the Lord for giving it. And I, and I hope that the Spirit of God will also uh, back that up because it, He gave it. And He'll back it up and help us to follow and, and be able to follow what He's trying to say in that. Okay, we have made... Uh, I'm going to change subjects now. Um, we have... Uh, made, I have made a statement um, probably many times since we've been in First Peter that I believe that Peter uh, really, really got a whole lot of his definitions and his concepts from the Psalms, from the Psalms. And, um, and up to this time, we've gone through in many cases, with the individual words, we've gone back to the Psalms, which I think is, is important also. But um, so what I want to do tonight is uh, I want to just uh, show you an example of what I'm talking about that Peter really, really drew his understanding of what he's writing about pertaining to Jesus. He got it from the Psalms. And, um, and what I want to, the, the particular place I want to read from tonight is a place that I didn't, I didn't see that until recently, like within the last two weeks, okay? So this isn't something I saw. What, what, what convinced, you know, at, at the beginning of this, it convinced me without me having seen these scriptures by the Spirit of God that would isolate passages in the Psalms. But this set that I'm going to share tonight is not an isolated bunch of scriptures throughout the Psalms. It's a flow from like the so-and-so verse straight down. And it's going to be compared with the flow of what Peter says in 1 Peter in, in the, the applicable verses that flows straight down. Now, let me say this. It's, it's almost a direct quote, but it's not uh, because Peter keeps on going and he, he adds in. But see, Peter looked at these verses and many others in the Psalms and he didn't see what we saw. Most people go to the Psalms and they're looking for comfort or blessing or, you know, something for that for them. And Peter went there and he saw Jesus and he saw more than Jesus and he, did, and he saw more than Christ crucified, if you will, in the in the context of Paul. He saw the 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 cross in relationship to the sufferings of Christ in the Psalms. And, he, and, he, and, and it moved him, and it changed him, and it, uh, uh, it, it brought substance to him as he moved forward. So, um, the scriptures I want to read, first of all, and there's no good way to do this because the, the verses don't uh, match up. He bleeds over into verses, but we're gonna, I'm just going to read 1 Peter 3.10. First, at first Peter 3 10 through 12 and um, I want you to listen I want you to listen to the words that he uses and the the the, the point that he's trying to make okay so let me let me read that for you please this is first Peter 3 10 for he that will love life and see good days let him refrain his tongue 
from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Um, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Okay. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and read through Psalm 34, beginning with verse 12. Okay, Psalm 34, verse 12. Now just listen at first, and then we'll go back and we'll do some comparing and whatever. Psalm 34, verse 12. What man is he that desireth life, and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil. Remember, this is the Psalms. And thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Now I hope just from that simple reading that you can that that you can see and many of you have been really pressing in and studying first Peter and just reading over and over and over. So I know that you you know the the part that I read in Peter, but it is amazing how close I mean, it's, it, it's exact almost in places that Peter is getting his ideas of the cross and of what's not, not the cross, meaning what is, what is evildoers as opposed to doing good. Remember, we've gone over those words. And, um, um, and he's come to conclusions about Christ and about his sufferings and about our participation in that. Okay, so let's just, let's go uh, through it again. I'm going to read 1 Peter 3.10, and then I'm going to read Psalms 34.12. Okay, 1 Peter 3.10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. That's Peter. Psalms. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good, Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. And look at the terminology. I mean, the words, you know, evildoers and, and them that do good and all of that. And then, uh, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. This is Peter now. For the eyes of the Lord are, are, are over the righteous and the ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Psalm 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, <laughs> and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. All right. So, th this would be a very interesting search if you had the time to take these scriptures and um, to uh, and, and I don't guess we're really at that point yet but when we get to chapter 3 and we start seeing the real meaning of all these words that Peter's giving and he spells it out but he's using these words and then go to Psalms and read it and, th and then try to think about how we perceived that, those scriptures before and how Peter got it and the Lord gave it to him and revealed uh, the sufferings of Christ in relationship to that and our, our blessing to be partakers of that. Um, and the contrast is amazing. Uh, it's probably not any greater than the way we used to go to First Peter and read it and get, you know, the, the most 
nominal view of what he's trying to say. Well, don't do evil and da 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 da, or don't be an evil doer. We say, well, I'm not. You know, yeah, but are we? According to what Peter saw in these scriptures, also. Okay. Um, I am. This would be so short if I cut off now. I'm just so, so weak right now. Um, okay, so I think I will do a little bit on this chart. I'm going to read a verse. I'm going to be in First Peter chapter 1 again. And again, we, some of us, some, not all of us have been involved in this class from the beginning. So some of you, this is a little bit of a rehash, but it's set in a different thing that God may help us to learn it. Um, so I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read First Peter chapter 1, verse 5, uh, 7, and 8, okay? Who are kept by the power of God through faith. Okay, so this is faith here unto salvation, which ties it to the salvation of our soul, as we shall see shortly, um, ready to be revealed, okay, in the last time or the end, um, that the trial of your faith, I'm sure I got, there it is, tried, trial of your faith, are you, are you getting this? <laughs> the trial of your faith, being more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and glory, praise and glory, at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, meaning seen him in this way, you love, in whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable, and full of glory. And then uh, also verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Okay, so now what I want to do, and uh, uh, I, I want to go back and read some of the Psalms that we went over. I'm not going to read them all. But I want to go back and read some of the Psalms that we went over previously. And I want you to begin to notice, first of all, obviously notice what the salvation of the soul refers to. But also, just as important, is to notice words that are used in, uh, in Peter um, in relationship to the salvation of your soul. Okay, so this is Psalm 6, 2 through 4. And this one's just kind of a preliminary one. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me. And that does refer into chapter 3. Um, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also vexed. My soul needs salvation. But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. Not deliver me from my enemies. Deliver my soul that's freaking out in the circumstances. Oh, save salvation of my soul. All of the things that, that we just read. For the, save me for thy mercy's sake. Um, okay, so now Psalm 62, verse 5 through 7. My, my soul, my soul. Wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is of him, meaning what's going to come in the end. Uh, in, in, in the end, you will save me, he's saying. He only is my rock. Okay, that rock is also included in the first chapter of, of Peter. Um, for he only is my rock and my salvation he is my defense. I shall not be moved. My soul will not be moved. And God is my salvation. 
and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Okay. Um, just a few more here. <clears throat> this is Psalm 72, verse 13. He shall, this is Psalm 72, verse 13, He shall in the end save me. He shall in the end spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. Not save them from the problem, but save their soul from freaking out and not being with him in it. He shall redeem their souls. Salvation of the soul is, is how the phrase that Peter used in 1 Peter 9. Um, he shall redeem their souls from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. Which is crazy because he's definitely not delivering. He said precious will be their blood in his sight. Okay, this is Psalm 120. Psalm 120, verse 1 and 2. In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips. Here's the mouth down here at the very bottom for those of you who couldn't read it. Let's see, right here. We have lag in this. <laughs> um, uh, deliver my soul. From lying lips. Now remember all those scriptures that we read that, that matched up. Um, and from a deceitful tongue. Okay. Deliver what? My soul. My, my mind, my will, and emotions that, that are not with him in the corridor. Okay. Uh, Psalm 123 verse 4. Our soul our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those. Okay, I lost my little evildoer that I, I drew up here some time back. Uh, but, but he's talking about the evildoers. Uh, our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. Okay, our soul. All right. Uh, Psalm 124 two through five, and this is the last one. Some of you probably know this one well. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, that's evildoers, okay? Evildoers. Then the waters, wait a minute, then they swallowed us up quick when their wrath, okay, where's the sufferings here? When their wrath was kindled against us, always against, the evildoers are always against. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The streams had gone over our soul. That's where we'd be losing the battle in our soul. Then the proud, wa then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Okay, what we've done by using this chart is we have shown uh, certain words that are used over and over in Peter. We've shown certain words that are used over, over, over and over in the Psalms that match or correlate to a certain definition. Okay. And when Peter, in he didn't get even down to 10 verses. He got to verse 9 before he talk, started talking about the salvation of our soul. Uh, and we talked about that. That's, you know, that's not, our soul is not automatically saved when we get saved. We're born again of the Spirit of God. And our mind, will, and emotion must be renewed to that. And Peter sees that not just as some Christian mind, will, and emotion renewal to be a Christian. So I'm a Christian now, so I don't think like I did. He's talking about, Peter's talking about in relationship to these things, and so was David. So was David. All right, so what, uh, what I hope to be able to do here is that as we have, and since 
some of us from the past have gone through this, um, that we can begin to see how these words are going to be used and other words are going to be used with another subject. And that other, other subject, the one that's central, the night that whichever night we do that, um, you, we're going to see those words matching up and supporting even some of these words. And we're going to keep going until we realize that all of these things, and I don't know, I mean, I hope that you were able to see tonight how these words are are legitimately tied to the salvation of the soul. And when we talk about the corridor, we talk about somebody going in, and when they first get in, they maybe are going through, you know, they maybe don't even understand what they're going through, that this is the sufferings of Christ, that they think it's just the devil or whatever else. But then they get in here and they realize that it is, and as they're in here, their soul rises up against the evildoers who are falsely condemning them and saying horrible things that would never be true of them. And they're having to wrestle with their soul to be with Jesus, the one who suffered the same stuff. And it is the same sufferings that, that we see in our brethren um, so that we might have the salvation of our soul take place in this process and then we start seeing it and, uh, and of course that that process is um, we are gosh I'm, I'm gonna do this tonight but I'm gonna ask you that maybe sometime soon I can unmute your mics and videos and I can call upon different ones to <clears throat> tell me where this fits. What I'm talking about is this. We have the three chamber corridor of the sufferings of Christ. We have words that Peter, or that at least right now for you, Randy claims, although I know that's what he's talking about, is talking about the sufferings of Christ. So, at which point in this three-part corridor does each word fit? Now, go with me. Maybe you can answer this already in your head. Okay, so let's talk about the sufferings. All right? At what point where would this fit? Well, we know that it's all the way through, but it's really primarily sufferings um, when our soul starts getting getting freaked out about everything and that but it's not the sufferings of Christ it's just our soul suffering so we can put that there okay how about the mouth well if I had my little guy up here that's an evildoer no no it's fine I said to do that um, his mouth would be speaking down on whoever's in the corridor and saying all these things that are causing his soul to rise, okay? So, where would being tried fit? It too would, would kind of be across, beginning uh, here in this part and moving into that, okay? Um, so, that's, that's the problematic part. But let's remove these parts now, instead of seeing it as somebody who's having just a hard time or looking at the issues. And let's think about the purpose of God in this, all right? So where in here would faith and believing and hope be? Well, it's either going to happen over here at the beginning. Or, well, we can say the hope will be, uh, be right here if we understand it. This is the girl. This is somebody that understands it. She has hope going in there, and she believes it, and she walks in it here, okay? So, um, uh, at a certain juncture in here that leads into the second part, Christ is revealed in her as that lamb. He appears in her. It's life. It's, she's no longer bound. She's no longer troubled by the, the storm that the evildoers are doing, 
she's going to be with the Lord in his sufferings. Okay, instead of like Peter, running away when they came to take Jesus. All right. So then um, God will look and he will see that faith for the appearing of Christ and he will call that precious. Again, this would, we'll put it over here. But it will be precious. This is, this is the true meaning of precious is when God sees our faith that has been tried and comes out as gold. All right? And then when Christ appears, we have received the end, the goal, which is glory to Jesus whom we allow to live in us and glory to the Father who gets his Son out of the altar. I don't know I can say it any better, so I'm going to stop. But uh, I hope that little thing that we just did gives you a good idea of how, what if we could take almost any word in Peter and lay it out on this chart and genuinely see that it fits within this and finally get to a place in our own mind and in our own hearts where we would know where the words go and what part of the corridor that they would go in. Amen. Lord, I know you gave me this chart and I know I'm um, such a weak and foolish vessel that I, I'm, I'm in my spirit. I'm so excited to, to communicate, to share. And I don't know if I go too fast or say too much. I just, I worry about that, Father, because I want your people to get what you have this class for, and it's more than a class. It's you wanting to open our eyes and our hearts. And so I ask you, Father, to please um, bless the charts and bless all of that and bless the stumbling that I do and reveal your Son not because of any greatness of anything except the greatness of him whom we love whom we gather to hear and to know and to, and to see. So, Father, have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen.